Welcome to Nursing 150 Module 1. Module 1 essentially covers the foundation for a med surge nurse. Um, we're just going to go over some basic concepts on the required knowledge base and skill level of a medical surgical nurse. Some of this is review of some of the fundamentals that you learned in your last semester. Um, so we're going to kind of review a few of those fundamentals and then expand on them. The general role of the medical surgical nurse is to have an expanded knowledge and understanding of the patient as a whole. You're looking at larger concepts kind of that build on this, the basic concepts, the basic needs that you learned in fundamentals. Those concepts are related to your patient's psychological, cultural, spiritual needs, and their biological needs as well. Um, basic concepts we're talking about is safety, oxygenation, mobility, sensation, nutrition, elimination, those basic concepts are, that you learned in fundamentals we're going to kind of build on them based on certain body system and disease processes. And recent advances in healthcare have made the medical surgical nurses kind of require them to have a very vast knowledge. We're having sicker patients in the hospitals. So um, it's challenging the, the general nurse to really have a broad base of knowledge um, because they're going to be taking care of patients who are a lot more sick that are in the hospital. Dosage calculation is one of those challenges that have been put on nurses. They have to have a vast knowledge of being able to know lots of different meds and how to calculate specific doses. And that that's kind of related to the next topic that we're going to talk about, which is safety. Um, and you guys have all kind of known that we focus in this program on dosage calculation and as far as safe med med administration for our patients. Safety has become a very high priority within healthcare facilities um, led by the Institute of Medicine in 2000 by putting out an initiative to prevent medical errors. Medical errors is one of the highest um, causes of death in the United States. In our country, we have a really high um, number as far as, as patient deaths that result from a preventable error. So all these institutions, Joint Commission, Institute of Medicine, there's many more have put forth initiatives to make sure that we are practicing safe. We have safe evidence-based practice and are providing safe care to our patients and preventing any med errors. You've probably heard of the Joint Commission before. The Joint Commission is an accrediting body for healthcare facilities. Um, it is a voluntary thing for a healthcare facility to have a Joint Commission accreditation. But what it's saying is that they have met standards that have been put forth by the Joint Commission. Uh, in order to be accredited by the Joint Commission, you have to meet a certain amount of standards. So basically what that says is to, to the public um, is that this facility has met the high standards of the Joint Commission and they are accredited by it. Um, Joint Commission puts together every year national patient safety goals. This can be found on their website if you want to look up the Joint Commission and look up the current national patient safety goals. They come about this by their surveys that they do across the country and all the different facilities. And they find basically, if they find a trend in um, med errors, safety errors, that such, you know, things as falls. Um, recently we've had alarm safety has been a national patient safety goal. They find these trends across the country, and so the, high, the, the things that rank the highest in these trends of safety issues, of med air issues, and that's how they decide for the following year what's going to be their national patient safety goal. So they sort of focus in on those trends that they're seeing across the country as, a, as an area of need where we need to focus as healthcare workers and, and fix these problems. And it's all, a lot of it's based, that's how we come about evidence-based practice. Um, we don't just do things just because that's the way they always did it. We do it based on evidence, based on research, 
based on what we have found produces best patient outcomes. SBAR communication has kind of come about in the past mm, probably 10 years, maybe more, and they are directly related to the Institute of Medicine issuing um, a need for uh, safe, safe care of patients. SBAR communication is a standard for communication between providers so that um, things are communicated well and that it decreases any safety issues with the patient and it increases patient good patient outcomes. Rapid response team is another um, initiative that came out of that um, Institute of Medicine report and from the Joint Commission. Rapid response teams were developed um, to decrease the amount of code situations that occur outside of the intensive care and also to produce better patient outcomes. They found that if we called in a team prior to a patient coding, um, then the outcomes for the patients were much better. It's important for the medical surgical nurse to understand what a rapid response team is, what the purpose is, um, and when to call them. Um, and to, notif to be able to identify a patient that is starting to have a change, that has had a change in their status, and, and to know when to call for help prior to the patient getting to the point where they're in a code situation. If the med surge nurse can identify this early and call the rapid response team, um, a team will come in, usually what the members of the rapid response team are a, a critical care nurse, a resident, or hospital physician, a respiratory therapist. Um, and basically what they do is they come in and they are another set of eyes on this patient that can kind of assess the situation to determine what we need to do in order to get this patient out of this situation. Um, sometimes it might be maybe transferring them to another level of care. It might be having diagnostic tests done. It might be getting the doctor in adding some medications, such as different things like that. Um, but they have found that they, since the, the initiation of the rapid response team in hospitals, that um, there has been a decreased amount of code situations and therefore better patient outcomes. Delegation is a very important skill that the medical surgical nurse needs to understand for various reasons. Um, we know that a nurse is kind of tasked throughout the day with doing several things. And the nurse has to learn how to be able to delegate tasks that can be delegated to unlicensed professionals in a safe way. Um, in order for everything to be able, all the patients needs to be met, they need to be able to delegate, but they need to be able to do it effectively and safely. The biggest thing that um, a nurse needs to understand is that only the task and not the accountability is delegated. So, and the important thing to think about, important principles of delegation is the fact that the nurse is still accountable for the task and they need to have that person that they delegated the task to to report back to them and um, let them know the outcome, that it was done, that it went well, and that what, you know, basically, for example, if you delegate to a PCA or a patient care assistant to do a blood pressure, um, you need to make sure that it was done. The nurse would then need to follow up in the computer and make sure that it was documented. And if there are any issues with the blood pressure, if it's too high or too low, the nurse is responsible and accountable for that blood pressure, not the person that it was delegated to. Every state has a Nurse Practice Act, which identifies the tasks that are um, legally and safely delegated. There are the five rights of delegation, which um, is the right task, right circumstance, the right person, the right communication, and the right supervision. Chapter 16 and 18 of Module 1 cover pre-op and post-op teaching 
for a patient, for a medical surgical patient undergoing some kind of a procedure. It also talks about discharge teaching for a procedure. Some of this is probably a bit of a review for, um, you know, from your fundamentals, but make sure you review these chapters regarding, especially regarding informed consent. Have an understanding of what informed consent is and what the nurse's role in informed consent is. Basically, it's never the nurse's role to explain the risk and benefits of the procedure. The, the physician performing the procedure, it is their responsibility to make sure they um, explain the procedure and any, um, any risk factors, side effects, things like that. Um, and there is the nurse's role to go ahead and have the patient sign the informed consent and um, the nurse will witness that the patient signed it and um, had an understanding. If there are any questions regarding the procedure, if the patient has any doubts, issues, concerns, they need to have a conversation with the physician again. So it's basically just the nurse's role to witness that the patient um, signed that they, um, and they consent for the procedure, not to explain the procedure. Pre-op and post-op teaching occurs immediately when someone is scheduled for a procedure. Preoperatively, there's a lot of diagnostic tests that are routinely ordered. Chest x-ray, basic labs, CBC, um, a metabolic panel are common ones. Um, make sure you have an understanding of why we do that. And it's typically to get a baseline or to identify if somebody is already at risk. Um, if we do a chest x-ray and somebody already has some pulmonary compromise, um, it's they're going to be they may not do the procedure due to the pulmonary compromise or they'll just go in knowing, having the knowledge that they're going to have to be a little bit more careful with this patient, especially postoperatively. Um, also, pre-op labs are determined, you know, make sure somebody is not anemic, make sure they have a good blood count, if there's going to be blood loss during the procedure. Um, lots of different reasons, and like I said, a lot of times it's just to do a baseline. Preoperative care is also um, entails identifying a patient that has risk factors for complications postoperatively. A lot of that has to do with their age, any medications they're on, um, any significant medical history, uh, diabetic, if they've had heart disease in the past, those, any pulmonary disease in the past typically puts somebody at risk for postoperative complications. So that's a big part of the nurse's role is to is to do that um, pre-op assessment, a history, and to identify anybody at risk for um, post-operative complications of, of a procedure. One thing to note is in, on page 244 in your book, in your Iggy book, um, it's table 16, four, it talks about all your herbals and all your naturals. Um, Want to make sure, a lot of people forget to mention these as a um, as a daily medication so they need to make sure we need to make sure that we ask questions if they've been on any herbals or natural um, treatments for any kind of conditions some of them can make them at risk for bleeding if they've been taking it and they might need to stop taking it in advance to the procedure post-operative care is a huge job of a medical surgical nurse. Um, we are aware of any complications that the patient might be at risk for. So that would be having a knowledge or require having a knowledge of their baseline condition and being ready for to prevent any post-op complications. Post-op complications include infection um, and mobility, decreased mobility, pulmonary complications. Um, so there's a lot. The biggest job of the medical surgical nurse in this situation is prevention of any of the post-op complications. And there's a lot of different strategies that we use. Um, the incentive spirometer is a big one um, for pulmonary toileting to prevent any pulmonary complications. Monitoring um, any wounds for signs and symptoms of infection. 
monitoring vital signs for any abnormalities, any post-op complications is a big, big job of a um, medical surgical nurse for a post-op patient. Another big job is teaching. Teaching the patient, you know, how to, how to change their mobility, um, the importance of doing their incentive spirometer, and then also teaching them um, what to expect when they go home. So discharge teaching. And that discharge teaching is going to start immediately when somebody's scheduled for a procedure. They try to start getting that already talking about the, what's going to happen at discharge. Um, and that's also talking about what to look for, what, you know, as far as signs and symptoms of infection, when to call the doctor, when their follow-up appointment is. It's very important to teach this and so that the patient is compliant. Postoperative patients need education regarding dressing changes that they might have to do at home. They also um, need education on pain management. They might be sent home on certain pain medications that they're going to have to have an understanding of how to take them and how to manage them. They need to understand any side effects of this pain medicine, such as constipation, um, any drowsiness that it might cause. They might not be able to drive. All those instructions um, postoperatively. They also might have um, devices, drainage devices, they might have to have some education on how to manage those. A lot of times it's very important to add a family member in the discharge teaching because a lot of times if the patient is in pain or if they're stressed they don't really hear what you're saying and they might not be able to um, remember what you tell them. It's always a good thing to put it in writing for the patient and the family member so that they um, are able to remember when they get home and are by themselves. Um, it's good for them to have a number to call to, um, to make sure they can, you know, call if there's any worries or concerns. Backing up to um, post-operative care of the medical surgical nurse when a patient immediately arrives to the unit after a surgery. They've typically spent some time in the, the PACU, which is the post-anesthesia unit, and um, then they arrive to the floor after they've been stabilized. But always, always make sure initially, especially in the first 24 hours after a surgery, that you monitor their vital signs more frequently. Um, you monitor their airway because they've typically been under some kind of anesthesia and you want to make sure that they're waking up and breathing okay. Um, the other thing is monitor any, for any bleeding uh, from any wounds. So check those wounds pretty frequently, especially in the first 24 hours. Gastrointestinal complications can be constipation. Um, so always kind of monitor that those bowel sounds. Typically, they don't have bowel sounds if they've had general anesthesia for about 24 hours. Um, but it's always we always monitor for the return of bowel sounds and return of an appetite um, and a return of passing flatus, things like that, in order to make sure that their GI tract has woken up from the anesthesia and they don't have any complications that way. Also, you're going to monitor for urinary output to make sure that their kidneys are, are doing okay and, and that they've, they're getting enough fluid. This concludes the video presentation for Module 1. Be sure to review Chapters 1, 16, and 18 in your Iggy Medical Surgical book. You also have other resources, including your um, NCLEX RN exam review. I look forward to reviewing this content further in class with you.